What the hell is this? You don't know, Lou. As soon as you think you do, he'll find someone else. Jack! Maybe he already has. Your movie was great. Thank you. Okay. Most people know Daniel Radcliffe as the young actor who grew up as Harry Potter. What was he like to work with? I mean, playing a the character of Ginsburg, but also having some sex scenes. Was that kind of challenging for him? Did he... Uh... Dan? No, he approached that sex scene like any other scene. And that scene, it's a scene of somebody having sex for the first time. Let's be honest, for a lot of us, that first sexual encounter can be terrifying and scary at first and you don't quite know what you're looking for and then in the rush of like physicalness and the uncomfortableness you realize that that's this doesn't feel good and right and you've seen the scene ultimately what that scene becomes about is he realizes he's looking for the emotional intimacy that he's been searching for with lucian's character for the entire movie you walked in here you ruptured the pattern bang the whole world gets wider How did you? Uh, it's consonants. A reiteration of themes. I'm just really proud of the way that scene turned out because, you know, here's where I go into gay cinema. I will say the one thing wrong with a straight man directing a film about gay characters, AKA Brokeback Mountain, that sex scene, I've never had it quite happen the way that it physically happened in that scene. And if anything, what we wanted to get right for cinematic history and depict it as honestly and emotionally and physically yeah. honestly as possible. But I will give you one fun fact. It wasn't Dan that was nervous about that scene. It was the crew. The crew was nervous and everyone was just like oh, tripping over light stands and like worrying that they were going to get in the way and everyone was just so on edge that I did the most ridiculous thing, thing possible. I blocked the scene with my female DP playing the other character. I played Allen Ginsberg and we blocked out the sex scene and made everybody crack up. And you are? Alan? Alan. And nice, David. It's a queer movie. It's a gay movie. And that's not a negative thing. Allen Ginsberg once said, they asked him if he was a Jewish poet. He said, yeah, I'm a Jewish poet. I'm a gay poet. Um, you know, this definitely, this movie is about a young man finding his voice as an artist. And this is Allen Ginsberg. And his sexuality had so much to do and was such a large part of his art and was a part of why I found him when I was 15 and 16 and cared so much about his work and, you know, created this deep adolescent connection with him because he was so brave in a time when it wasn't just uncool but scary and, you know, he was brought to the freaking Supreme Court in an obscenity trial over this to put his sexuality, wear it on his sleeve, put it in his work and say, this is who I am. So it's... Alan's coming of age and Alan's discovering his own sexuality because this is a story about Alan Ginsberg, yes. It's one of the most important parts of the story. Your object of desire in this film is Lucien. It's this male. The traditional femme fatale role, the object of desire, is played by a male. I think that's what makes this film queer in every way, not because of you being a queer filmmaker. You never see men in the object of desire. You always see women as the object of desire. You know, I've seen my Hitchcock. I've seen my film noir. I knew I needed an icy blonde. Um, this one just happened to be a guy. You know, but it's, this we were telling the true story. It was Lucian Carr who was like, you guys, let's start a freaking revolution. He was the one who came to Allen Ginsberg and said, you know what, I think I see a poet inside of you. Are you a writer? Because I've got a job for a writer. No, I'm not. Was it um, challenging to find actors who were willing to take these roles head on and because we're talking creating some of the most iconic people in history. So was that a challenge, finding actors who were willing to go there? To play Ginsburg, Burroughs, and uh, Kerouac? You know, we all had a moment, you know, we're chugging along and then, oh my God, I'm playing Jack Kerouac. Oh my God, we're writing about Allen Ginsberg. And the way that I consciously reacted against that was I said, you know what? We're gonna stop reading all 50 biographies from front to back. We are just gonna focus on the point of them from birth up into the point where this movie ends in 1945. Because we are not doing Allen Ginsberg underline, underline, nodding and hinting to the man he's going to become later. We are doing Allen, a working class kid from Patterson, New Jersey with an emotionally ill mother, 
um, who's Jewish, who doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. Maybe I'm going to be a labor lawyer. I just got into Columbia University. Oh my God, I just met this beautiful young man. Oh my God, I might be gay. That's who we're playing. Well, you're not anything yet. I also love like the fact that people really look like that era. You know, but often you see Hollywood actors who are buff. Daniel looked like somebody from the 40s. That was deliberate. I told Dan, you know what? Nobody manscaped in the 1940s. No groomers, no personal body trimmers. Let it be what it is. You're playing Allen Ginsberg here. Um, and also just, you know, with the body types, I told all of them, do not overwork out too much. No, I told him, this, and that's why when I read that Chris Evans was interested in the role, who I think is a good actor, and I think cast originally, uh, I thought, oh my God, he's too buff. He's too beautiful. It's too wrong for that era, not because he's not you a know, actor. He was a part of the first incarnation of the cast, but Chris auditioned and freaking killed it. And in that alternate version of the movie with those four guys, Jesse Eisenberg, Chris Evans, Ben Wishaw, and Lucas Haas, which obviously is not going to get made. It would have been a completely different film. No, that story we'll just tell real quick is basically, so I meet Daniel Radcliffe. We get along infamously, he auditions, he all kills. I'm ready to cast him. His agent says, hold on a second. He's not available for two and a half years. And I'm like, what? Oh, we still got two more films left to do. Deathly Hallows 1 and Deathly Hallows 2. So at that time in uh, putting together this film, I went with my other first choice for the movie, which was Jesse, and then built a cast around Jesse Eisenberg. The financing came together, it fell apart. It came together, it fell apart. Finally, the social network comes out. Jesse becomes a well-known name. We start attracting financiers to the project. Jesse calls me and says very honestly, John, I think I just played the most iconic Ivy League college student I'm ever gonna play in my life. I think I need to play Grown Ups now. And of course, while that upset me, um, I understood, it made complete sense. But here's the kicker. I remember meeting Daniel Radcliffe and I said, wait, how long has this been? Oh my God, it's been about two and a half years. I emailed him. I do what you're never supposed to do. I wrote Daniel Radcliffe a personal email um, saying, hi, Daniel, I hope you don't think I'm stalking you. Okay, we all know, never use the word stalker. It's a complete ex-girlfriend behavior. Um, but I remember our meeting you know, so well in your audition. And if you're ever still interested in talking to me about this project or want to do it, please let me know, send. Oh my God, I can't believe what I just did. I woke up the next morning, I got a response from him, one word, absolutely. What happened? Well, you don't know. This movie took, you know, probably now over a decade to make from initial conception. You know, for me at my core, the thing that I realized that kept me up at night and kept me so, you know, would keep me calling people the next day to try to get this movie going, would keep me just being so freaking persistent, is the fact that in 1944 you could literally get away with murder by portraying your victim as a homosexual. And the fact that that's not just a dirty, you know, stain on American history, but obviously looking at what's going on in the Soviet Union, looking at what's going on in countries like Yemen and several countries all around the world where you can still get away with murder by beating up and killing a homosexual in the name of a greater social justice. You know, that just infuriates me. And while this isn't a political movie by any means of the imagination, it's part of the emotional core which caused me to wake up every day and want to tell this story.